We understand male disease. And often when women go into a healthcare setting, their symptoms are discounted or sort of attributed to some sort of psychosomatic thing. So there's this very remarkable, by remarkable, I really mean just terrible, history of women who are miscategorized as having like psychiatric illness rather than something very acute that's happening that actually is not related to your neurological health or, or mental health. When you start like scratching and digging, you realize there's a whole series of mountains of complexity around this issue. What's up, August? Zorro Premium Gang. As always, I want to thank you for your continued support. If you are listening to this, you are part of the heart that pumps life into Auxoro and the podcast we create. As a reminder, you get the full video access to the video versions of every Auxoro podcast, so don't forget to check out the YouTube link on the episode page. It's unlisted, so it's for your eyes only. Also, being a premium subscriber gives you access to all archived bonus episodes of The Aux, so please enjoy the back catalog. This time, I sit down with Dr. Daisy Robinton. She is a cell and molecular biologist, a co-founder of Oviva Therapeutics, the director of women's health at Cabrian Biopharma, and one of the most forefront science communicators on women's health and longevity. As you can tell, she's not very ambitious. (laughs) She has two great TED Talks you should also go check out called Can We Engineer the End of Aging and Thoughts Matter? How Mindset Influences Aging and Lifespan. One of the things that made me want to speak with Dr. Robinson is that she is not only an active participant in pushing forward the science of women's health and aging, she also communicates it in a way that's exciting and digestible to the average person like myself. In this episode, we get into how it's possible to engineer resilience, the beauty of studying stem cells, why women's health has been systemically left out of scientific research until recently, the film Sound of metal, how Daisy balances a modeling career alongside her scientific pursuits, and more. Without further ado, please enjoy this deep dive with Dr. Daisy Robinson. What's up, guys? I'm here with Daisy Robinson. Daisy, thank you so much for joining me on the Auxora podcast. I really do appreciate your time. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, everybody. So let's jump right into it. As a molecular biologist, much of your science communication and research has focused on helping humans live well for longer and effectively engineering resilience. How do we engineer resilience from a molecular biology standpoint? It's a really great question and I think one that so many of us really want to understand better. Um, It's funny because, you know, I've I've been a scientist for the vast majority of my life and my work in that training has been trying to better understand the biology underlying well-being and how do we promote that. And what's funny in some ways is a lot of people feel that the real hardcore science around that can be at odds with a lot of the lifestyle pieces, but What I've continually learned is that so much of our lifestyle choices are really what influence our biology to allow us to have resilient living. So, you know, when I think about engineering resilience for for myself today, not, you know, 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 years in the future, a lot of that is the basic kind of stuff that we all hear, you know, getting a good night's sleep, um, exercising regularly, eating healthily, normally, not binge eating, not binge drinking, things like that. Yeah. Um, And... You know, so there's there's just a plug I want to make for all of those things, which I think people don't love hearing as much because sometimes, you know, we want an easy fix or a pill or a strategy. And um, and I think there are some really innovative solutions coming from biomedicine for how we can really engineer our biology in a in an interventional way to support resilience. And I think we have a lot of tools available to us right now to do that if only we're willing to commit to the behavioral change. Mm -hmm. It sounds like engineering resilience from a biological standpoint is part the responsibility of the human being that's trying to make a certain change where it's modifying Mm -hmm. certain behaviors or maybe even completely changing certain behaviors like the way you eat or smoking or, or exercise, things like that. And then also technology and practices developed in the lab from a scientific standpoint from people like yourself who are 
trying to come up with tools or procedures or just trying to find interesting things in the body. I know it's a very uh, layman's term or, or layman's explanation of engineering resilience. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like it's a combination of behavior and scientific experimentation. Yeah, and and you know, I think even taking it when you take people that are biohackers, for example, they they do this kind of experimentation directly on themselves and, and compare. I'm not that aggressive with it. I tend to just have my lifestyle choices that I make that I know influence my physiology. I mean, there's plenty of studies that show that sleep, for example, is something that can directly affect your longevity and obviously directly affects your ability to process stress and juggle multiple tasks and be cognitively efficient and, and things like that. And similarly, you know, when we engage in practices like, like exercise regularly, like mindfulness and meditation, um, always healthy diet, of course, these things do change our biology directly. And, and those changes can support a way of being that is more peaceful, more content, more happy, um, you know, I guess everyone can define for themselves what resilience means, but for me, it's, it's really to have the bandwidth to be able to keep up with my own life, which of late has been more difficult. Um, mm -hmm. but do that and enjoy it and feel really vibrant and feel available for all the things that happen in your day, whether planned or unplanned. And, and especially of course, enduring, enduring challenge and enduring, um, you know, any kind of adversity and being able to come through that and have, you know, a positive outlook on the other side. And those things are really difficult. And it's it's not just physical, it's also emotional and spiritual and, and all of these things. And I think that having a suite of practices really supports that. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's funny for me, I'm, a, I'm from Silicon Valley. I, I grew up in the Bay Area and, and then I did my um, undergrad in Los Angeles and then I went to Harvard for my PhD. And in addition to science, I've been a model a long time. So I've always lived in these kind of multiple worlds that straddle like hardcore science and then like hardcore wellness and mm -hmm. what a lot of people in sort of the scientific series community might think is a bit like hand wavy fluff um but there is data there are data that support a lot of these things that are steeped into the wellness community as well that really support mm -hmm. human resilience so you mentioned sleep and to dive into something more specific like sleep in within the greater wellness community, what are some of the, the ways that you've experienced modifications in sleep or changes in sleep that have benefited you or research that you've done firsthand, talking to colleagues as well? What are some of the most exciting ways in which we can modify sleep to enhance performance and enhance that vibrancy you were talking about? Yeah, I mean, right now, there's not a lot that I'm aware of that's interventional around sleep that's like cool technology. I mean, probably a lot of your listeners are familiar with something called the Aura Ring. It's a, it's a ring that you wear on your yeah. finger and it measures different parameters of your health. And of course, smartwatches do this kind of thing too, and, and I'm sure other devices. Um, those are more monitoring oriented. They don't really do anything actively. Um, but that being said, there's a ton of research on sleep. I actually haven't been involved in any research on sleep directly myself, but um, as someone who's a, a nine hour sleeper, horribly, <laughs> it's very hard to get nine hours. Yeah. And if you never ever put an alarm clock near me, that's like how long I would sleep every night. Um, I've just cared a lot about it because it's hard to sleep that long in today's day and age. Um, and with the kind of demands that we have in our lives. And so, you know, I've just really spent a lot of time looking into why it matters to support, especially when I talk to other people who are like, you're leaving, you're going to bed. And I'm like, nine hours, I need it. Yeah. You know, your immune system, actually there's this, it's relevant now with, you know, COVID and, and all the vaccines and vaccinations that are happening, happening globally and, um, and, uh, things of that nature. When you have poor sleep for, I think it's a week leading up to a vaccination, it actually mm -hmm. reduces the efficacy of that vaccine by something remarkable. I, th I forget the exact number, oh, wow. so it's like 20 to 30% less efficacy in terms of the response that your, your immune system has to that vaccine, which is a, a real direct representation of how sleep supports strong immune function. And it's critical for mm -hmm. our ability to physiologically be 
resilient to you know a challenge. And in this case, it, this was a study done just looking at how sleep influences response to a flu vaccine in particular. Um, it was done, done a, a while ago, maybe a decade, five or ten years ago. Um, and so if you had two you know, people that now, were, if you had uh, two people that were about to get the flu vaccine let's say next week and or a week from today mm-hmm. and one of those people slept like shit so maybe they average five hours a night of sleep and they're not mm-hmm. someone who can function well in that and someone else got let's say eight hours of sleep each night the flu vaccine would do a better job at protecting that person from the flu who slept better so yeah, if we extrapolate the data, I mean, it's 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 hard to, um, you know, when we look at data, we're looking at groups, right? Because every individual is different, so it's hard to ever say like this will happen for sure. But across a group, if you have let's say two groups of people that are in the experiment you described, the people that got five hours of sleep, on the average, will have a much less effective response, and um, the vaccine will do a poorer job of protecting them, mostly because their bodies are doing a poorer job of protecting them because they weren't supporting their body's function. And so their body wasn't responding in the way that, you know, we want it to, to provide the maximum protection from the vaccine, um, you know, Mm -hmm. stimulating the immune response. And then as the flu season goes on, more of the people who were in the five hour group are going to get sick. And actually, if you think about it, like this makes you can extrapolate that even further to say those of us who are sleep deprived have a weaker immune system in general and so are more susceptible mm-hmm. to viral illness and will have, generally speaking, a, a harder time getting over that. And I think, you know, when we think back to the beginning of COVID and and we just didn't really know a whole lot about any of it, that was one of the things that I, that I talked about publicly was, you know, we don't really understand a lot of what's going on, but what we do know is that our immune system needs to be strong, which means go to sleep, <laughs> get fluids. Yeah. Make sure your diet is supporting, you know, the immune function and get your vitamin C and, and vitamin D and all mm-hmm. those things that, that tend to support that. And if you're not in a state like that, it can be a lot easier for a virus to take advantage of, you know, a, 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 an environment where the protection is low. Yeah, it's funny because only recently, because of science communicators that are putting out great information like yourself or Andrew Huberman at Stanford, uh, Mm -hmm. Lex Friedman, Aubrey de Grey, people that talk about sleep or other things that are related to sleep. I only just started modifying my sleep and experimenting with my sleep within the past Mm -hmm. couple years ago or a couple years or so. And I played baseball all the way through high school and college until I was 22 years old. And I never thought about sleep tied to performance. I would have my checklist for the day where I got in my workout, I ate well, I did mobility training, I did whatever cardio I had to do, running or sprints, and if I didn't perform the way that I wanted to perform, I never thought, okay, how much did I sleep leading up to this start as a, as a pitcher rather than the previous start where you know, maybe I did significantly better this start and then the week before I threw like shit was it because I went out Mm -hmm. Thursday Friday night got four hours six hours of sleep those two nights and then through even though my nutrition and exercise was being completed and those uh I never thought about those things as an athlete when (laughs) I should have been leveraging it and now I'm leveraging it to just feel better and try to live a more fulfilling life overall. So it's interesting the Mm -hmm. things that are coming out for sleep. And there's definitely a huge community of people. I would imagine millions of people that are, I know millions of people are listening to podcasts, listening to interviews that talk about sleep and then using that to try to apply it to their own lives. So it's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, speaking of athleticism or athletics and athletes, uh, Tom Brady is, famous as a long sleeper. I think he's a nine hour a night sleeper. And it's like part of his very rigid program to your point. And actually, um, I know Andrew Huberman, um, who you mentioned earlier, he's a friend of mine. He has, I think a podcast episode. I know I've seen it somewhere in his content, just about circadian rhythm in general. And it's like one, one aspect of that is how long you're sleeping, how quality is that sleep you're getting, but also Mm -hmm. what is the rhythm of your day? And are you 
keeping a continuous circadian rhythm, meaning like you're going to bed every night, similar time you're going, you're waking up every morning, similar time. And then, you know, what he put on his Instagram a ton was, was watching sunrise and sunset and the impact of that Mm -hmm. light on like coming in through your eyeballs and stimulating your brain in a particular way to either prepare you for the day or to prepare you for winding down you know, based on on what you're observing. And and there's all these physiological cues that are available to us to support either wakefulness or sleep. I mean, we've all heard that it's bad to be on screens late at night. That's no surprise Mm -hmm. to anybody. So like turning that off towards the end of the evening and like reading a book or God forbid, just talking to a person, which is harder to do these days. (laughs) But live in human form is supportive of that. So there's a lot of really interesting work in that space. Yeah, I, I actually just listened to that episode where he was talking about the, I forget the name of the actual rhythm. It was ultra cadian or maybe it's it was different than circadian, but he, sure. he was saying how it it happens in these ninety minute cycles of energy, whether mm-hmm. you're asleep or awake, and that mm-hmm. caused me to experiment with taking away a half hour from my sleep, which may or may not be good because I sleep for eight hours. And then if I'm going to wake up at mm-hmm. the end of a cycle, uh, that would be seven and a half hours. Then I also recently changed my workouts mm-hmm. to the morning so I can get some morning sunlight outside as long as I'm in the Netherlands. So I'm not working out right before bed, which is what I usually right. do. So yeah, that that was a very, a very exciting podcast and a very applicable podcast because it, it caused me to change a uh, couple things right off the bat and what did you notice when you made those changes so i i was expecting to feel more tired throughout the day and, and it's only been about six or seven days since i did uh, switch the workout so it's not a ton of data and then the mm-hmm. the sleep has been a little bit longer it's been about a month and a half, two months for the changing the workout, I expected to feel more tired throughout the day, but I've actually felt the opposite. I feel like Mm. the workout gives me energy. And one of the reasons Mm. I was so hesitant to change was because I'm so protective over my hours of around 7 a.m. to noon, 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. because I feel like that's the most creative time for me where I'm actually doing work that moves the needle so i thought why work out in that window yeah uh because that's i'm doing creative work but i've actually found that within the past week or so it hasn't really led to a mental fog later in the day and and i Mm -hmm. and i've actually felt less foggish if that's a word in the the late afternoon when i have those morning workouts and my and my sleep has been pretty decent i've never really had problems sleeping so it wasn't uh it it wasn't like a a move of desperation. It was, it was something I was curious Mm -hmm. about to see whether I would just like it from a workout standpoint and it so Mm -hmm. far so good. Cool. So you've spoken a lot about CRISPR, especially in one of your Ted talks. And I wanted to get into CRISPR for a little bit and the, the stem cell self renewal processes, tools to reverse aging. What are uh, some of the most exciting ways that stem cells are being used at the moment, whether it's in in general or specifically to reverse aging? And how good are these tools at what they do? Yeah, it's such a good question. Stem cells is such a tricky field. Um, I I got into it really early on. in what, I guess the early 2000s, there was a a lot of controversy around it then because we were using uh, human embryonic stem cells in research. And there was, you know, a lot of um, sort of ethical conversations around that. But in any case, I I got into that in large part because my my sister, when we were young, was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And at the time there weren't, and even still, there weren't really viable treatment options for someone like her. Um, In that disease, your, your immune system attacks cells of your pancreas so that you're no longer able to regulate your insulin or your glucose in your blood. And, um, and so I got into science in large part because I saw a need around serving people who didn't have therapeutic options and whose diseases weren't well enough understood to create innovative therapies. And so stem cells to me seemed like such a game changer because you have these cells that have 
this great potential. They have the ability to become many, many different types of cells. And so we start thinking about cell replacement therapy and, you know, cell renewal and things of that nature. And since I started that training now, gosh, how long has it been? 15 years ago or so. So much has happened in that space. And we understand much more deeply how a lot of that biology works. And I would say that we still aren't where a lot of people think that we are with with the science and with the therapeutic potential. I mean, we've actually been using stem cell therapies for a really long time. When you think of blood transfusions, mm-hmm. um, that's that's a lot of what's happening. You're, you're putting in blood cells and they are able to populate uh, in a patient, um, especially when you're, for example, in a cancer patient, you're, you're fully depleting their whole um their whole system with radiation or something like that. And then they get an infusion afterwards of cells that repopulate that. Mm -hmm. So that's not new, but I think from the standpoint of using stem cells to support cell renewal and to support longevity, I think there's a long way to go before we have really clear data on that. I do know that we have, you know, a lot of biomedical development that's happening right now. That's looking at reprogramming cells to, Mm -hmm. Um, shift their identity from one type to another that can help support healing, for example. So, you know, heart disease is one of the leading causes of death in, in the United States. And um, and so there are a lot of, of no one use jargon, but there's a lot of, um, I guess, scientific models, like experimental mm-hmm. models that are being used right now where we can basically simulate something like a stroke or a heart attack in an animal and then apply cells or some sort of molecules that stimulate cell renewal to help with the speeding process, to help with the healing process and also to reduce the scarring that occurs. And I think that's probably the area with stem cells that is most likely to be effective and in in the clinic soon, which is like being able to improve healing, but also not be tumorigenic and, and reduce scarring. And and that's always the, the, difficulty with stem cells is you have this careful balance of wanting things to renew and regenerate and be fresh. Um, but a lot of the genetic programs that drive those characteristics also turn on in cancers. And so it's a really careful balance between when you're getting something that you're sort of restoring to a more youthful physiologic state, but not ac- accidentally activating a tumorigenic program and causing cancer. Um, mm-hmm. That's like one of the number one fears in that field. Um, really? So, yeah. So it's it's and there's you know a lot of complexity there because you're you're adding you're adding cells into a body or you know in some cases you're you're putting in factors that can stimulate cell division to to promote renewal, like we've talked about. So mm-hmm. it's a tough space and there's a lot of people hard at work on it and there are some companies out there that are doing it. Um, I would say that there's a lot more, how would I put it? There's a lot more um, kind of hand wavy <laughs> stuff that I've seen that's promoting um, promoting healing and promoting you know stem cell therapies that I just think aren't proven and it's a little bit of a scary zone because yeah. I think there's a high potential for there to be um, bad things happening. The worst, the best case scenario is that nothing happens. Worst case scenario is that someone, you know, gets cancer from a treatment that they thought was going to help them with their knee surgery or something. So, you know, it's, it's tough and and the data are mixed still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you hear all the, the great stories that happen, the positive outcomes and Especially if you follow sports like baseball, there's a lot of guys who will opt to get go to another country and get stem cell replacement on their rotator cuff or something before they get surgery or UFC. And you hear the stories of operations that went well, but there's no incentive for people to publicize the ones that didn't go well or maybe even just went okay because – yeah. If you're a business, I imagine you want to attract more and more athletes, especially professional athletes that have the money to blow on these type of operations. And you mm-hmm. know, I, I, uh, I, I don't know nearly enough. It's just as a, as someone who is a washed up college baseball player, kind of following some of the stories of guys coming back from injury. Sometimes uh, stem cell mm-hmm. therapy is thrown around, but yeah, it does seem like some aspects from it, at least 
from the articles I read or, or interviews I listen to do seem shady in a field with a, a huge amount of potential. Yeah, and that could be very lucrative too. You know, money money mm-hmm. drives a lot of development, and if it was very efficacious, we would have plenty of clinics in the United States that offer it. It's it's not absent because we haven't figured it out. <laughs> I mean, it is absent because yeah. we haven't figured it out, but it's 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 more because when you actually look at all the data, they aren't clear in support of using that kind of treatment. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and that's that's kind of the bottom line. And so for me, for, for people who come to me, like friends and family who ask me about this, knowing that I've been in the stem cell field, um, I always say that the data just aren't there. And, you know, it's everyone's decision how they want to proceed. But for me and, and for my colleagues and the mentors that I've had who work in stem cells, that's kind of the party line until we get clearer data that show that the benefit outweighs the risk it's not Mm -hmm. going to be a thing that we recommend and you know, everyone's going to take risks that they're comfortable with. And a lot of people do. And I actually know a number of people who've had some sort of stem cell treatment to help, especially with some sort of bodily injury. Um, but it's just something I would never do. And I would urge any, like anybody dear to me not to do (laughs) until we, until we have clearer data that are, I mean, you know, because at the end of the day, to me, what I wonder, especially in these other places in the world that are doing it, I wonder what's actually in there. And I think that's what's hard is characterizing what is being put into your body and when, where is it going mm-hmm. and what is it doing? Um, and, and is it actually stem cells? <laughs> it there's is, a and huge is it actually amount of data cells? actually on just the placebo effect. Like mm-hmm. there's a huge positive benefit we get just from doing any kind of intervention that we believe will work. I mean, our mind is incredibly powerful and we... By taking a pill that has no active ingredients in it, we can relieve a whole host of very real, very physiologic symptoms. So, mm-hmm. you know, I wonder how much of it is that, and it's it's hard to say because you know, we're not collecting the data. But yeah, that, that's something that definitely crossed that's something that definitely crossed my mind when I was taking more supplements in college, where I would buy something from Vitamin Shop or, or GNC and it's not regulated and so i'm wondering you know what is actually in this and if the thing that's in it if uh the thing it says on the bottle is actually in it how much of this supplement is making me feel what i'm feeling and how much of it is i just took a scoop of pre-workout and that's making me feel like i'm ready to go like the action of Mm -hmm. dipping a scooper into a pre-workout container and putting it in my mouth, just thinking about that makes me like more uh, more hyped up. Yeah, and I think also when we talk about supplements and vitamins, a big thing in that field too is maybe it has in it exactly what it says, but the point is that it's difficult actually to get absorbance of a lot of these types of mm-hmm. nutrients in the pill form. And so the vast majority of a lot of these types of compounds are actually just kind of excreted through your urine and they don't ever Mm -hmm. make it into your body. And, you know, I'm really not an expert in that sort of thing. So I tend to, I don't generally take vitamins or supplements and I I don't tend to um, dive into them because I think it's really complex chemistry that I, (laughs) I don't love learning Mm -hmm. about personally, but I, I do know there are a number of important vitamins and minerals that really require being basically compounded with something else just for your body to be able to take it into the bloodstream from one reason or another. And, and mm-hmm. so taking it in a powder form or vitamin form isn't really going to do anything. Um, mm-hmm. Other people would better speak to, to examples of that. And, and there are some robust studies of certain vitamins and supplements and things like that where there, there is a benefit observed. But I think that they're unfortunately few and far between relative to the huge volume of, um, you know, products and sales that are being mm-hmm. pushed in that space. You mentioned the the regenerative properties of stem cells. Is that is that regenerative property is that what keeps scientists coming back to experiment with stem cells? Is that the mechanism that people are trying to tap into to do things like regenerative therapy or <laughs> things that may eventually turn into reverse aging treatments. What's what's the mechanism in the stem cell that makes it such an interesting type of cell? And, and what does that look like? If you could explain that a little bit. Yeah. 
I mean, there there are a number of features of, that are unique to stem cells that make them so important, and the regeneration aspect is certainly one of them. I mean, uh, we all know that as we age, we we get more we have more wrinkles, like we're ickier. Our body doesn't respond as well to exercise or illness or things like that. Um, and a lot of that is because with age, we start depleting the stem cells that are in various tissues. Most tissues in the body have what's called a resident pool of stem cells, which means like a, a specific niche of cells that's you know very specific to that tissue. So like liver stem cells or you know neural stem cells or what have you, muscle stem cells. And over the course of a lifetime, just to keep up, um, you know, just to keep up with living, those will divide. And what's amazing about a stem cell is when a stem cell divides, it has basically two different options. One is that it will, will do something um, where both of those, what we call daughter cells, are stem mm -hmm. cells. So they can become the same, which a lot of cells are able to become the same thing. But the second part is that they can also then do what's called differentiation, which is assume the identity of another cell type. Usually in a tissue, that's a more uh, more specialized cell type of that tissue. So mm -hmm. if you're you're needing to replace a certain cell type because of injury, then the stem cells will divide, and some group of them will then become the stem cell that become the specialized cell that was damaged. And so you can replace those cells. And so when we think about why they're interesting therapeutically, it's because they have the potential, generally speaking, to become any cell type in the body. Now, it really depends. There's a bunch of different kinds of stem cells. I mean, the sort of ultimate of the ultimate is an embryonic stem cell, which literally can become any single cell type in the entire body. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really all about the potential, it's like the, the potential uh, to become that. It's like the uh, Thanos mitt of stem cells. It can uh, basically do everything. It's like having all five rings, uh, the one, the one yes. ring to rule them all. <laughs> Yes, exactly. It can yeah. do anything. They're extremely powerful. They have the ability to divide endlessly um, and to become any cell type. And so when we think of lots of terrible diseases where you're losing cells or losing function of a tissue for some reason, then you know you basically can look at it as this, this, this Thanos factory of like, okay, well, let's just mm -hmm. make some more of that and put it in the right place to replace what's going wrong. And um, you know what's tough is that it's really complicated to actually execute that. I mean, not only do you have to understand what it what it means for a cell to be a certain type, and that means you know what genes are turned off and on, what sort of epigenetic landscape is in play in that cell. Epigenetics are like the regulatory layer that sits on top of the genes, basically to help control which genes are on and off. Mm -hmm. There's metabolic differences. Um, there's a whole bunch of physiologic differences between cell identities. And unless you really deeply understand that, it's hard to coax something into becoming that. And then, you know, you also need to put it in the right environment. So if we're repairing something in the heart, you can't just give yourself an injection in the arm necessarily. You know, you probably mm -hmm. have to get those cells into circulation, or maybe you have to open up the chest and put it directly at the site of the injury. It's, um, it's a whole it's a whole suite of obstacles that make it really difficult to effectively use cells that we might engineer and there it's being done and people are doing it. And it's really interesting and really cool. And mm -hmm. you brought up CRISPR earlier. I mean, we just successfully yeah. treated um, patients with CRISPR for the first time uh, recently, sometime in the last few weeks. And, um, and there's been some really huge advancements happening in that space. I don't work with CRISPR anymore, but I, I did spend several mm -hmm. years working on it um, right after it came out extremely powerful technology and you know what's exciting now is that it's just getting more and more refined so we can do more with it mm -hmm. which will aid in this reprogramming of cells for regenerative therapies and you know longevity therapies things of that nature yeah i, I remember in your first TED talk, Can We Engineer the End of Aging? You talked about the seek and destroy mechanism involved in CRISPR, where you have these, these proteins that can basically slice DNA and do it very precisely. And it, it's, it sounded like a, you know, a, if you were going up against another army or something and they were just seeking you out with the, the submarine missile and trying to 
explode something or, or attack the enemy, but do it in a very precise fashion, not like dropping a huge bomb, but basically just slicing it out clean cut. It was, it was very fascinating the way that you described it. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very powerful technology and a lot of that is anchored in the precision that it's, that it wields. I mean, everything that occurs in our body is largely driven by the gene expression that's happening. I say that as a geneticist, so I tend to think genes are, are very, very important for everything. Um, and, and what makes the gene function the way that it does is the, is the sequence of nucleotides that make up that gene. So the letters that sort of spell out the instructions for what the gene is doing. And what's mm -hmm. amazing about CRISPR is you can basically program one part of that CRISPR compound to recognize a very specific sequence in the genome and it targets the CRISPR machinery to that site. And these days, instead of just seeking and destroying, which was sort of the early days of CRISPR, you, you, you mm -hmm. can direct the, com the complex there and then it will cut it. Um, and there were lots of things that we could do at that moment. Like, you know, it would either disrupt the gene or sometimes if you flooded the space with another sequence, it might integrate that sequence so you can add in mm -hmm. Um, an additional sequence into that site. Um, but now you could do something as precise as change one letter of the code. And wow. so many genetic diseases are the result of a single, what's called a single nucleotide polymorphism, which is like mm -hmm. a single mutation in your DNA that then leads to either a loss of function or sometimes an add of function that's, that's bad for you. And um, and so, you know, there's a company called Beam Therapeutics. My friend David Liu is a co-founder of. Um, he's one of the people that's really iterated on the CRISPR technology to drive innovation in that space. And um, and what the technology that they're using can do is essentially direct the CRISPR complex and change out any one letter for any other letter, which can correct huge hosts of genetic diseases, assuming you can get it to the right tissue in place, which again, like the delivery of a therapeutic is still a huge challenge. Um, yeah. But it's it's opened up the field to be able to correct a lot of problems. And I think in the future, we'll usher in an era where just like we go to some other country to get stem cell therapies, hopefully we do things more regulated and safe, but you will most likely be able to go to a clinic to get some sort of genetic modification of your choosing, you know, and I think it's just a matter of time of when and how that's implemented. I think in the near term, it'll be for very serious diseases because we still think the technology is moderately risky. We don't totally understand. It's a totally different landscape and, and sort of ethical field to consider changing the genetics of humans interventionally. Um, but I do think we're going to see more of that in the coming years. That That's crazy that you're able to go in and alter one letter within the DNA sequence to be able to do it that precisely. And even if it's not a, a, a generally available thing right now, just the, the potential of being able to do something like that. And you alluded to doing gene therapies or, or altering genes for traits things like that that is th that's crazy to me that that that's that's wild it's like uh it sounds like it should be science fiction but it's slowly becoming reality it's super wild i mean imagine if you could apply this is out there probably i don't know any science to really back this up but imagine if you know instead of women who are going to get their women or men excuse me anyone who's going to get their hair dyed and they're doing yeah. <laughs> that, I don't know, I don't dye my hair, but like once a month or whatever, I hear it's very expensive. It's obviously treating your hair with all these chemicals. But imagine if you could use some sort of product that changes the melatonin producing compounds, you know, in your hair follicles so that instead of going to dye my hair all the time, now my hair is just red because that's the mel that's the type of melanin that's being produced. You know, that's, mm -hmm. for example, like a cosmetic product. And, you know, people are wearing their contact lenses in the eyes. I don't know anything about how eye colors formed. I imagine maybe that's set at birth. But, you know, there's a lot of cosmetic things that I think are interesting there. But then there's certainly a lot of metabolic and, um, you know, other functional changes that one can make genetically that would have an impact on how we operate that I think are really interesting. And I think we're very far from that. I think the appropriate use now is obviously therapeutically for genetic diseases um, until we have a better handle on, on what it means and how it works and 
I would be remiss to not also say like there's also the access piece of how expensive is, is this technology going to be as mm-hmm. a treatment for people who's able to get it. Um, you know, there's people all over the world that really need this kind of thing and it can be really hard to distribute in an equitable way. And I think that's another thing that requires a lot of thought and I'm no economist or policymaker, but it's it's something in the sciences that we, we do have on our mind as we develop these therapies and we want them to be accessible to people. Yeah, if there was a company that had an app where I could log in and a doctor would change my eye color for that weekend or maybe my hair color or I would tell them, you know, I don't really want to go to the tanning booth, but I want to be a little bit more tan for this next trip. I'm going to Greece and I want to, you know, show out. I want my abs to, to pop a little bit. I, I imagine after the the health component of being able to change specific letters of DNA and, and DNA as a whole, that fashion is going to come very quickly because people care about how they look and people want to look good. And I, I, mm-hmm. I, uh, I don't know if I'm more excited or scared of a, a market like that because of the implications of, you know, what, what becomes you then what I, it, yeah. I, I'm my eye color. Like that's how I've always seen it. I'm, you know, more or less my skin tone, uh, within, you know, plus or minus a few shades and I'm my hair color. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, well, if I can change all that, then what, like, what, what is the essence of the physical me? Yeah. And I would argue that we've already done that. And that's what's so interesting about this is we just, technology changes how we relate to ourselves and also how we relate to the world and also how we relate to ethics. There's actually a great book by Juan Enriquez called how, how technology transforms our ethics. And it talks about how as technology advances, our sense of what is ethical and correct changes with that technology. And, um, you know, when we think about, I think a lot of people would have this kind of very natural anxiety or fear. And what does the future look like when I can just change my genes and, and look and like be different than I was, you know, quote unquote, naturally born. But, you know, yeah. people are doing this all the time. People are getting nose jobs and boobs got boob jobs and they're dyeing their hair like we're talking about. And they're, you know, getting liposuction and, and um, doing all kinds of things, wearing makeup, you know, even something as simple as wearing makeup, like my eyebrows were not this dark this morning. I put on pencil. And so that's an alteration. Yeah. And, um, and it's just a, it's, it, it certainly feels more permanent because it's genes. It's not, you know, a dye. And I'm just but sitting then, here with I my know, barely. This job's pretty permanent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm just sitting here with my barely visible blonde eyebrows, but soon enough I can uh, change that from an app. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it, it might be a stretch, but it, it, it makes me think of, steroids in baseball because it it was such a Mm. huge topic especially back in the early mid 2000s when I was I just started getting interested in baseball as as something that I could pursue uh after high school and possibly as a a career which didn't end up working out but I I heard a bunch of different arguments that were for or against steroids and the word natural Mm -hmm. always came up and Mm -hmm. the more I think about it the more the natural argument for me didn't hold up there are other moral reasons and uh, health reasons to take steroids or to not take steroids Um, not advocating for anything obviously but if you have someone who a guy like me, let's say I produce a natural level of testosterone and then there's another guy to my right who produces 30% more testosterone, but it's also natural. The word natural Mm -hmm. doesn't mean the same thing. And so if you could Mm -hmm. alter your body in a safe way under the guidance of doctors and and people that know Mm -hmm. what they're doing, then aside from making people uncomfortable, what is the argument against it, it, it what, what is the argument for being natural i i don't hold being natural as highly i don't i don't put that you know state on a pedestal because i'm doing things all the time to rise above my natural state i'm drinking caffeine right now to uh 
be alert for a podcast. I'm working out to change my body. I'm, I'm doing all these things mm-hmm. to try to put myself in the state that I want to be in. And steroids is a very extreme example of that, but it, it's they're both unnatural ways to go about life. Yeah, I really love this topic, and I think the way you're thinking about it is, is, is thoughtful and appropriate because you know I've had so many conversations about this concept of natural because so many people really anchor into it because it it feels right, it feels better, it feels good, and that's sort of a cultural thing that we've developed over time. And then when you think about it, like you said, with your caffeine, or a lot of people will be like, well, I don't drink coffee, I drink tea. Okay, fine. Are you using a light bulb? Because that's not natural. Your cell phone's not natural. Like, this shirt isn't natural. Yeah. You're, you're um, a cheater. And I think you're a cheater athletics, with your light bulb. Yeah, you're a cheater. <laughs> but yeah. I think, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's somewhat arbitrary in where we draw the line on what does natural even mean. I mean, people who are born with genetic diseases, like, that was their natural state. Should they not receive a therapy? I think they should. And then when we when we start talking about athletics, I think there's a really interesting conversation emerging. Um, certainly, you know, around steroids, I think that's interesting. But even as we as we evolve into this new era where we're more accepting of non-binary people, how do we think about how do we how do we execute sport? How do we set up competition in a way that's reflecting the diversity of people out there? And rather than saying, okay, we have like men and women how do we place people that are transgender, for example, or, you know, is it something where we're defining certain parameters of this is a competition level where your testosterone range has to be between X and Y, because some people, women or female or male will have like super high levels of testosterone. Some will have low and that's just kind of luck of the draw, which, you know, you can argue being athletic in general is luck of the draw. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, we all have our, our natural athletic abilities or we don't. Um, and, and it is to me, I agree with you, a somewhat arbitrary choice to say that you have to be limited by what you can achieve without certain classes of compounds necessarily. Mm -hmm. Again, like I'm not advocating for people to go out and take steroids or other performance enhancing drugs, but I think it's a really interesting question that we need to be thoughtful about, especially as we continue to move forward in this era where not only are we accepting of people that are that are non-gender conforming but also as we are emerging into this zone where biohacking is becoming the norm in a lot of places and not just mm-hmm. through your workout paradigms and, and nutrition paradigms but through supplements or other compounds or perhaps in future genetic engineering you know who knows what it's going to look like or be like um I'd also make a quick plug for David Eagleman. He's a Stanford neuroscientist Mm -hmm. who's done a lot of really cool work um, and talks about how we can basically extend the human senses and have more senses and and build in extra functionality to the human body that we didn't previously have. And one example that I always loved is he was, he was making this vest that would like receive sound and, and it would create a pattern on your body. So you could basically like, if you were deaf, for example, you could like hear through pressure on your body but Mm -hmm. it also just creates this kind of like this new sensory relationship between sound and touch to help you integrate into the world in a more robust way and and, you know there's also a bunch of colors we can't see so what if we can engineer an ability to be able to see more from the color spectrum or hear more like you know supposedly dogs are, are hearing at higher pitches than we can hear like i think those are all really interesting future you know possibilities for us so you can hear through sounds on your body. You said you're wearing a device, and that lets you. It's not hear the same the as hearing. So okay, it's not the same as hearing, and, and I'd, I'd urge everyone to go look it up because I'm probably bastardizing it. But from what I understood, basically, sound would be received by this this vest that was being worn, mm-hmm. and that sound would be transmuted into. Um, basically movement on the vest that you would feel on your body. And so you're not hearing through your ears, but you're, you're experiencing sound through pressure basically and, and variations mm-hmm. in pressure that can be wow. a consistent pattern so that you could presumably understand or what that, what understand what that sound is. Hearing sound. I hope I'm not totally very bastardizing that. People look it up. <laughs> it's been a yeah, long time no. since I read about it, but I just it always stuck with me because I was like, that is so cool. Yeah. What a fascinating way to create a relationship with sound if you're compromised in your ability to hear sound through your ears. And and when you think about how sound works, you know, you receive 
the waves of sound into your ear into your ears and they, they create this mm-hmm. movement in your eardrum. Um, and so whatever the device was, it had some sort of approximation of that technology, but it brought it to another site in the body. Yeah, that's wild. I'm, I'm thinking about for, for people who are hard of hearing or pe- people that are completely deaf, if there was in the future some device that would take the vibration of words and translate it into something that they could actually feel on their body that would be its mm-hmm. own language, like turn into a, a vibrational language of uh, sensation. You know, there's, um, there's also some really cool technology being developed that is, is basically, um, you know, an implant in the brain that helps to, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it correctly. So I'm going to, I'm not even going to say it because I'm going to not remember it correctly and I don't want to misspeak about it. But there's, <laughs> there are other technologies that are, that are interfacing directly with the brain to basically help yeah. bridge that gap as well. And interpreting neural firing, like if you're thinking a sentence, then the machine will spit out the sentence you're thinking or something roughly approximate to that. It's, it's very cool. And, you know, I think yeah. it's at MIT where they basically had people watching, it's either watching something or thinking something visual and the, there's there's a sort of a, a reader a reading happening of the brain, and then the machine that's receiving the reading will spit out a picture based on what's happening in the brain, and it will approximate mm-hmm. what, what the person was watching. It's just super mm-hmm. cool, you know. It's a brave new world out there, and I think there's a lot of technology coming down that's going to really change yeah. change what was the, how we are as humans. Would you would you feel comfortable enough speaking on the advancement in CRISPR you mentioned a few minutes ago? You said a few weeks ago there was uh, an advancement in the CRISPR field. Yeah, that's that's the one that I was talking about. It's called base mm-hmm. editing, and it's basically base the ability editing, to okay. switch out the the single the single letter, and that's a huge okay, deal because okay. before there were there were pretty high number of limitations to how we could implement CRISPR technology. And, and the base editing um, that was developed and, and is now being um, developed by Bean Therapeutics. Um, okay, got it. So the switching out of the letter is called the switching out of the letter is called base editing. Okay, got it. Mm-hmm. When you're doing work in in the lab that could possibly be used on human subjects, what's the line between pathology and personality? For example, hmm. I've been I've been told that I have the I probably space out in public more than most of my friends because I I do feel like I'm inside my head a lot, especially in public where I'm maybe not hearing things that my friends are saying or, or I might not be just as in touch with the outside world as most people because I've been told many times that I'm like a very spacey person, but that also hmm. makes me a lot. Uh, that also uh, makes up a lot of who I am. I think that personality trait is a net positive, or maybe it's some underlying pathology. I don't know. Um, but when you're thinking about editing genes, how do you? Is there a scientific distinction between something that could be a pathology and something that could be a personality trait that it might be a struggle for the person to deal with, but if they get through it in some sense, or if they learn how to live with it, it will make them it, it will it, it will give them the ability to do things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do mm-hmm. i think that is an important philosophical question that i hope a lot of people think about who are in the sciences um you know one example that comes to mind immediately when you bring that up is the deaf community many of whom don't see themselves as having a disability they they believe that being deaf is really a part of who they are and, and isn't something to remedy um, and so two deaf parents might prefer that they have a deaf child because that's part of their community. Um, the same way that lots of communities want to sort of have consistency between generations of, of what their culture represents. Um, and I don't think that, you know, I don't feel so strongly about it that I would put a flag in the ground. I think it's a really interesting notion that we, the things that we are born with, whatever they are, are part of how we came into the world and do shape how we react to the world and how we perceive the world. And, you know, certainly 
for for me and I think for most people who experience any kind of adversity, it really shapes the human that you are. And that can be just circumstantial or that can be just, you know, whatever it is you're born with. Maybe you're born without a leg and that shapes who you mm-hmm. are and, and, and allows you to be a different kind of person. And for some people that'll be positive and for some negative. And I think really it's at the individual level to decide, you know, this is something I want to fix versus this is some point, something that makes me who I am. Or maybe you feel right. both are true at the same time. I think probably most, a lot of people feel that way, but certainly there are folks I know who experience some sort of adversity um, and, and it's overtly like, it feels like this other thing that's invaded their life. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, a, I, I think when you have that perspective, it's not necessarily part of your personality or part of who you are because you're rejecting it. And again, mm-hmm. like, I think this is really a psychology issue more than a science issue. I mean, psychology is science, but I think it's really a psychology of what is a person's relationship with whatever that trait is and mm-hmm. how does it shape who they are? What is, how do they accept it or not? Can that relationship change? And, you know, I think it's a really interesting question. I tend to lean towards things around the growth mindset and not being the best way to sort of move through anything, um, which has been demonstrated scientifically that if you have a growth mindset about adversity, it allows you to Mm -hmm. move through that in the best possible way and be a resilient person in general. Um, Have you ever seen the movie, the sound of metal? Yeah. Have you seen the movie, the sound of metal? Yeah. It It was incredible. When you were talking about going deaf, it, it made me think about, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's about a drummer in a heavy metal band who goes deaf and there's no way to reverse it uh, for his case. And the way that they filmed the movie is so cool. The way that they capture the audio is incredible, amazing because it makes you feel like you're inside his head. You're inside the drummer's head who's going deaf because it gradually becomes worse and worse throughout the movie and you can hear the vibrations and you could see people's mouths moving and you could kind of make it out so i imagine nothing's going to be a one-to-one translation of what it's like to be deaf but i imagine it captures a small slice of what it may be like to be someone who goes deaf and then eventually becomes almost completely deaf and there's an entire community in that movie that chooses to be deaf together. They choose to learn, they choose to explore nature, they choose to live as a community. And they, I forget the exact line that the guy says in the movie, the the leader of that whole community, but it's something along the lines of, you can't stay here if you see deaf, deafness as a, a negative or, or a pathology mm-hmm. or something like that like it's it's a mm-hmm. part of who you are and we don't see it as something we want to change about ourselves mm-hmm. yeah and i think that's really powerful and i support that i think that's an incredible way to live with whatever your circumstances are whether it's mm-hmm. you know, deafness or any other thing i think it's it's always a choice of how we how we respond and you know, when you have an acute condition that is life-threatening, I think that can be really different. But I don't know, when you read memoirs and watch movies or if you know somebody who's had a, a chronic illness or or who's had a life-threatening illness, there are some magical people who really integrate it into who they are and take it as this enriching experience. And I, I find that to be really inspiring and remarkable. Mm-hmm. I wanted to go back to the growth mindset for a minute because you mentioned that we could actually have an effect biologically on ourselves by the way that we frame growth. How how does the way that we perceive or how does the way that we introduce growth into our life or, or perceive stress affect us biologically? What happens at a biological level when we frame stress negatively or or we frame it as more of a challenge yeah there's there's some interesting work on this and it's hard to it's hard to really study directly and for me it's it's in some ways a belief system 
um, more than extremely robustly supported by data. But of course, there are there are actually some really interesting mm-hmm. pieces of data that examine this. And really, it's a it's what I've looked at in my in my own just personal research for fun is how a positive outlook can positively influence our life and our well-being and our longevity and, and our health. Um, and you know that's a little bit separate from growth mindset specifically, but but they're they're related and it's hard to tease apart how much of it is like your perception, your mindset, and then how that then translates to the way that you relate to the world and other mm. behaviors that tend to cluster with that which are probably what are actually responsible for the physiologic shifts that can occur. But, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a number of studies that have been done. um, One in particular that was done out of Yale that showed that people who had a positive self-perception of aging, which is to say like they, they think positively about the changes associated with aging, they tend to live longer. I think there's something, it was like between five and seven years longer than than people who oh, tended wow. to have a negative self-perception of aging. Now, that's not to say that if you have a positive outlook, you're going to live longer, but it there there is some kind of relationship there that's been found across a number of studies where a positive outlook and an ability to, you know, take adversity in stride and, and grow with it allows you to physiologically perform better um, mm-hmm. throughout your life and generally speaking, suffer less illness, be happier, live longer, things of that nature. And so, you know, I, I think, I think again, that it's a choice and I think it's a really powerful choice to make to say, this really sucks, whatever's happening. And there's something I can learn here, or there's some way I can grow through this. And like, you know, that will benefit you more than it will just to wallow in the suck. And I will also say that I think it's really important to acknowledge things that are, that are negative and accept them and not just, ignore them. I think there's this sort of like toxic positivity thing that's very real that does not help us as a species and as a social species to just need everything to be okay all the time. That's not at all what I'm advocating for, but it's it's the relationship we have with things that happen to us and for us and being able to see that we can grow with whatever's happening, whether it's positive or negative or hard or easy or you know challenging or whatever. Yeah, there, there's a lot there's a lot of people and a lot of accounts that post things like be positive or just have a positive mindset as some sort of prescription that's supposed to have an effect on your life. And there's no actual there, there's no actionable package there. There's no how am I supposed to be positive? How am I supposed to be, you know, what is being positive in a situation where you lose a family member or you go through a shitty breakup? Mm-hmm. Like what are you just supposed to smile and pretend to feel good until you do feel good? And, and I much prefer uh, a mindset more in line with what you're saying is not necessarily prescribing a, a positive or a negative to a situation, but whatever is happening to you to find a way to enjoy it and manage it as best as you can, whether it's something like you're having a conversation with a friend or you're having, uh, you're going for a really tough run or maybe you're going through something more long-term like a a breakup. Thinking that you're in a negative situation probably won't help, but you can recognize the fact that it is negative and then ask yourself, okay, what can I do to enjoy the situation as best I can without putting the pressure on myself to be overwhelmingly positive. And I fail at that many, many times. I suspect my life will be a journey of (laughs) getting better at enjoying the things that would be good to enjoy and just being present in general. But yeah, I, I definitely, I do also think that that just purely positive mindset is many times unhelpful it's almost as bad as the yeah. just like everything sucks like pe- like straight pessimism the the pure optimism for no reason or, or no actionable steps and pure pessimism with no reason i think those are equally as bad yeah and i think you know you, you use the word enjoy a lot and i think i just to draw some attention to that as we talk about this i think you know when i when i think about this kind of thing 
for me, it's sort of a value. It becomes a values question because we also tend to, like you said, like sort of prescribe positive and, and negative labels to things, which mm-hmm. I think muddies the waters a bit. Um, when really it's, for me, it's a question of value. So like I can be in a very difficult, challenging situation that is ostensibly negative or bad. Um, and I can still derive value from it. And for you, that might be, you know, the the language of enjoyment might be what we're Mm -hmm. maybe saying the same thing. But for me, it's not necessarily about having like enjoyment. It's so, it's so much as it is, you know, when I look at the situation, a, can I accept the reality? I think that's always the first step of like, you know, the what ifs and the, I wish this didn't is not helpful to anybody. It's like, this is the situation and it's bad. It hurts me emotionally or whatever, you know, physically or whatever thing is the situation is challenging and where are my values in in what's happening and and Mm -hmm. what can I derive from this that is of use to me or that allows me to, I think just ground in in myself. I think when things are really bad, you know, like you mentioned loss of a family member. I've, I've lost grandparents. I'm, I'm very grateful that I haven't knock on wood. Um, lost any of my immediate family and, and, um, you know, or dear friends. And so I feel, I count myself very lucky for that. And I know when that time comes, no one can, will be able to tell me like, there's something you can find in this that's mm-hmm. positive. And I think there is room and, and certainly, you know, when you read things like that book, when breath becomes air, that was written by the Stanford neuroscientist who died of, mm-hmm. I believe a brain tumor. Um, it was a really popular book that that was sort of about end of life basically and oh, yeah. and like where can we derive value and richness in in adversity and I think that that's always available no matter how terrible something is there's there's value to be derived in it and it and it might not be positive and it might not be enjoyable but there is growth to be had in any situation mm-hmm. um, and you yeah know, I. At the same time, I'm imagining someone in some shit situation listening to this and being like, you don't know what you're talking about, which is probably fair. So <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, someone, I agree someone, that, but I, if you, if you say something that is powerful in, in some way, it's, it, someone's always going to disagree with it. So no matter sure. what you say, if you had a positive or negative or whatever value outlook you have, someone's always going to detract from that. I, just, I have one more comment before we get into women's health specifically. So I had a grandmother who passed away a few years ago, my mom's mom. And she, my my mom would never say that it was in any way positive that she passed away. As a, as, as an observer to what my mom was going through, where she was after work every single day, she was going to the hospital. She was spending an extra 20, 30 hours a week caring for my grandmother. It was so much added stress onto her. And when my grandmother passed away, it was, of course, very upsetting to, to lose a mom and, and all the things that go along with that and to lose a grandmother as well was, was very upsetting. Along with that, I did see a release in my mom where she, it, I, as positive is the wrong word, but it's just like in this super shitty situation, there is a way that she got some sort of growth out of it to where now she Mm -hmm. has all this time that she can bring back into her life to spend with other people she cares about or or just hang around and and do nothing or talk with my dad or whatever. And so that's a situation where there are both sides of the coin present in, in in the same uh, outcome, which no, I can't think of anything that's an entirely positive or entirely negative or entirely uh, a growth opportunity without some speed bumps along the way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I wanted to to get into women's health specifically, and you are the director of women's health at Cabrian Biopharma and the co-founder of Oviva Therapeutics, which focuses on ovarian function and longevity in women. And so Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask if you could talk about the unmet need in women's health, which you've been so vocal about, 
And what drew you to focus on ovarian function bes besides the obvious? Um, you're, you're a woman, of course, but you, uh, you also talk about some very interesting things that uh, men and women should be interested in if you have women in your life that you care about. So could you talk about some of the unmet needs and how women are being left behind in, in studies and uh, healthcare overall and, and what drew you to focus on the specific ovarian function? Yeah, I mean, obviously this is a space that I'm deeply passionate about and it's a bit funny how it came about. Um, obviously I'm a woman, um, but I never studied women's health particularly. Uh, it wasn't really something I, I thought a ton about other than, of course, being a woman. Um, and it wasn't until I was about 30 or 31 years old, I, I went through a breakup with a long-term partner and I knew I wanted to have children. And so I was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not like in a concerning position, but I'm 30, I'm not getting any younger. And so let me just, you know, see if I can learn anything about my own fertility potential um, to make sure that if there's any problems, I can address them now. That was, that was sort of my point of view. And really, I probably only had that point of view because my older sister had a little bit of struggle with her fertility, um, largely related to her type 1 diabetes I mentioned before, which is, is very common for people that have chronic illness of any kind. Um, and, you know, I have a couple friends who had some fertility issues as well, and it's an extremely emotional and, and devastating problem to have to manage. And so I was just not nervous about it, but I you know, in, in my ideal life, I, I find a partner who I want to build a family with and then I build that family and it's all hunky dory and somewhat straightforward. And, and that's not true for a lot of people. It's not how it works out. And as a single 30 year old woman at the time, I didn't want to be in a situation where I'm going out on dates, wondering at the first date, if this person can father a child, <laughs> you know, like I didn't want that. Yeah. So, um, I just want the stress. I'm going to need you to pee in this cup before the second day. Yeah. Uh... We're just going to do a little genetic test to see our compatibility. Um, yeah. <laughs> so anyways, long story short, or maybe not so short, but um, the story is that I, I went to speak with uh, a mentor of mine who's married to the mentor I had for undergrad. She's an OBGYN in, in Los Angeles and runs a fertility clinic. And, and she kindly sat down with me to just sort of talk about that kind of stuff. And she's like, you know, I know you're a scientist, but I always like to, in my first consult, just kind of explain how the cycle works and, and you know, what we look for in fertility. And, and then if you need intervention, what that, what, what we do for that. And I was like, yeah, just start from the beginning and the basics and just assume I know nothing. And, you know, I'd rather just kind of like start at the bottom and, you know, capture anything I didn't randomly know. And I thought to myself, I probably knew most stuff. And what I was horrified and embarrassed to learn was that I was completely ignorant about so much of what my own body does and how it works in a monthly cycle and how that relates to different aspects of my health. And it just was eye-opening because most of what I learned that day was completely new information to me. And I had a PhD in biology. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I was thinking to myself, oh my God, if, if a scientist doesn't know these things that are kind of basic um, from the standpoint of like how things work, mm -hmm. most people probably don't know anything about it and, and it's integral to our health. And so I started just on this learning journey basically about women's health, about like, you know, female physiology. And I started learning a lot about menopause, which is the next sort of big hormonal transition in a woman's life. And, you know, it's funny, we think about, we think about being, I don't know, I guess I was in like fifth grade or fourth grade or something like that when we first had talks about puberty in classrooms you know we have like a formal setting where we talk about puberty and what happens to your bodies and you start growing mm -hmm. hair and like girls will get periods and like you know i think most of us remember some sort of awkward class like that in school when we were when we were young kids yeah and then at some point you have sex ed where you talk about pregnancy and contraception or hopefully you know a lot of places don't do that but um, you know, you, you presumably are learning something about that as well. And there's never really any structured time after that where, where women in particular learn about how their bodies change. And of course, all of our bodies change with time, but, but the ovaries that women have distinguish us in such a way that we really do have distinct physiologic phases in our life that dramatically affect 
not only our health and well-being, but our ability to cognitively function, to sleep, um, the immune function, sexual function, all of these different things. And the fact that we don't really have a place for the fertility conversation and the timeline associated with that. And then the menopause conversation, which is probably one of the most important pieces of information that you really need to know as a woman, it just doesn't happen anywhere. And I just became increasingly furious that there was all this information that wasn't anywhere that wasn't accessible. And it took a lot of work for me to go and and find it. And, you know, as I got deeper into learning about that, I was um, even more enraged and horrified to learn about the, the utter lack of attention and funding that's been gone that's gone to female physiology in general so when we think about science as as like a franchise as a as a thing that's that moves forward the needle on human health women have largely been left out of that and that's in part due to the um, perceived complexity of the hormonal cycles of women and of female creatures because you know in, in in a lot of biomedical research we use mice or dogs or um you know, other species. <clears throat> and for the vast majority yeah. of time, we've used only male animals because they're simpler and it reduces the variability in the signal um, that you're looking at. So it makes the data cleaner. And that's what's thought to be true. And so what that means is that for decades and decades and decades, we've understood human biology only in males. And so when mm-hmm. women go to the doctor to be diagnosed for something, if they're experiencing symptoms, they often aren't properly diagnosed because we've only really put together the diagnostic parameters for men. And so women are often misdiagnosed. They're often sort of, you know, in a medical setting, um, their, their, their pain and their symptoms are not noted in the same way. And they don't get the same type of care that men get because we don't have as well characterized uh, an understanding of, of what's happening in females in general when they're healthy and then when they're unwell. And similarly in drug development, last little thing and then I'll Mm -hmm. get off my soapbox and let you ask another question. Um, In drug development, it's also been similar where we've largely developed drugs and tested safety for even consumer products in males and male bodies. And so what that means is a lot of drugs that have been pulled off the market for adverse effects disproportionately negatively impact women um, in a huge level. And some of that's a dosing issue because obviously like there's kind of size differences in adults. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's more so that our physiology is different and we just haven't taken the time or the care to understand more deeply how a female body is different from a male body at the physiological level and how this relates to disease pathology wellness mm-hmm. and, and therapeutic use. Yeah, there, there's a lot there to, uh, to, to go <laughs> back to, uh, I wanted to go back to fertility because you, you started off by mentioning an experience where, uh, you went to a doctor to discuss fertility and you realize that as a, a, a PhD candidate and a, a scientist researcher that you didn't know nearly as much as you thought you did or you, or you didn't, uh, th- there's a lot of information that you weren't privy to. And as someone like a scientist, um, that's, a, that's obviously a, uh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting gap. And, and I, I don't know if it, it probably says more about the way that society goes about distributing that information, that, it, that it's not mm-hmm. being uh, distributed through the literature. W- what are some of the most fascinating things that you learned about female fertility? Some of the things that you, some of the things that you probably uh, should have been introduced to by either teachers or uh, just you know, maybe YouTube videos or, or people spreading information online. And I, I'd obviously never ask you to share any uh, specific medical information, but at a general level, what, what are some of the most fascinating things you learned about uh, fertility uh, that the average woman would be interested in or probably should know for her own good? Sure. I mean, part of it's like the, the question you're asking is specifically about fertility, but if you don't mind, I'll expand that a little bit just to like female physiology, which yeah. intimately ties with fertility, but they're, yeah. they're in relationship with them, not the same. I mean, one mm-hmm. of the things that continually blows my mind, even though I've now known it for quite some time, is that our ovaries reach their maximum potential before their first use, which is to say, you know, generally speaking, our ovaries are... They house all of the eggs that we'll ever have for our whole life. I think most people 
most people tend to know that. Some people might not, but you know, you're, when you're born as a female person with ovaries, you have a whole set of eggs in your in there that are waiting to be used during your reproductive lifespan. You don't start ovulating those eggs until you hit puberty and then you have your period. And then generally speaking, you have one egg a month that's released, that's available to be fertilized. And over years, the eggs that are in your ovaries diminish. And once they hit a certain low threshold, that's when menopause is triggered and, and essentially you lose fertility and um, you stop producing a lot of hormones and a lot of terrible things happen <laughs> for, the, for the large yeah. part. Your aging is accelerated and all these other systemic disturbances happen to your body. Um, but what's interesting is that the eggs that are produced for a woman are actually, they're made in utero, which is to say that, okay. um, you know, if, if you're a woman carrying a female baby in a pregnancy, that female baby starts growing her oocytes and actually reaches the maximum number she'll ever have in her life at about 20 to 23 weeks of gestation. So a 20 mm -hmm. to 23 week pregnant woman with a girl inside of her will have the girl will have like six million eggs and then by the time she's born she'll have like one million eggs so while she's mm -hmm. still in the body of her mother she's already lost the vast majority of the eggs that she's ever produced and then by the time that puberty starts when you actually can use those eggs there's only about three hundred thousand. and then the thing that really blew my mind because we all think like okay you can get pregnant you know at some point in your cycle because you release an egg once a month you actually are producing about a thousand eggs every month and only one of them is, is chosen basically to be presented and available for fertilization. So every mm -hmm. month that you're cycling, you're losing a thousand eggs from your ovarian reserve. Um, and if you're taking birth control pills, for example, that doesn't change. Like you're still losing the eggs every cycle, regardless of whether or not you're actually able to get pregnant. Um, or not, um, as it relates to birth control pills. And so that was something that really shocked me of like, oh, it's not just an egg every month I'm losing, it's a thousand eggs every month that I'm just losing all the time, yeah. <laughs> constantly. And you're just like, you're approaching this cliff and then you fall off the cliff and then, you know, you have all of these things happen because the, the lack of the hormonal regulation that we are accustomed to for all of our lives changes and you know i think there's lots of memes out there about like hormonal crazy women but our home our home our hormones are well first of all men have hormones too i'll just say that and and one like funny thing i'll say about that which i also learned which isn't related necessarily to female physiology mm -hmm. but is related to male physiology that i thought was interesting and came out of this work to understand sex differences is that um men can vary widely in the hormonal levels i mean we were talking about testosterone earlier and steroids and um as part of this understanding of, of males versus females some researchers were looking at the hormonal differences between animals to understand you know is there cyclical fluctuation of men or sorry of hormones mm -hmm. in males and testosterone is something that fluctuates wildly as, as you as an athlete should know you know if you're like in a super high training regimen your testosterone generally is increased and that that also creates a different feeling in your body. I mean, I'm an athlete as well, so I know when I'm in like a super heavy training paradigm and my testosterone is up, I have a different kind of energy about me. Um, mm -hmm. And so they found that, you know, animals, male animals also have a lot of fluctuation in their hormones um, and, and women do as well. And I think it's important that we understand that so that we can manage it when it's feeling a bit unmanageable, whether that's because you're mm -hmm. going through puberty or because you're going through menopause or because you're pregnant or because there's some other hormonal disturbance. That's real physiology that's affecting your ability to be present, to cognitively function, to sleep, to manage stress, um, your cardiovascular system, your immune system, those are tied to that as well. And so, you know, I think it's something that we really need to acknowledge is important and serious and not just some flippant thing that, you know, oh, women and their hormones, you know, which I think it has been the attitude for a really long time. Yeah, and I can imagine if, you know, the, the stigma that women are acting a certain way because of hormones and there are hormones pumping through the body, both male and female, that mm -hmm. maybe those hormones aren't being researched as much as they should because of the, the stigma or maybe uh, people might shy away from exploring that because they don't want to to prove uh, 
not prove men right, but if there is a connection between hormones and behavior and by understanding that you can live a more fulfilling life, um, mm -hmm. that stigma may lengthen the period of time to which that comes to fruition because people may not want to even touch that or they're like, oh, you know, that doesn't matter. Like, it's just chalk it up to uh, it's her time of the month or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, recognizing that hormones in all creatures are critical for us to be able to live and and they affect our experience of the world. So, you know, we've talked a lot in this conversation just about resilience and well-being and I think that's ultimately from my really early work when I got into science and was interested in stem cells to now, the through line is I want to do work that supports well-being in humans and I'm just sort of mm. following a path that I'm using different ways to do that over time that, that the way I'm doing that is changing, but the why is staying the same. And, and I'm really excited right now because with Oviva Therapeutics, what we're aiming to do is really expand not only the work itself, but the awareness of the work, the funding into the work, and really elevate the ability of, of us as a broader society to, to understand ovaries, ovarian function, hormones mm -hmm. in the body, how they're deeply intimate with our health and well-being at a broad level, and how they are connected to our, our health span and our longevity. And, and those are things that are kind of obvious um, when you actually mm -hmm. look at the science and you look at the data. They're so intimately connected, and yet they've been so overlooked and so underfunded, which is, you know, is completely infuriating, but in some yeah. ways is really exciting because there's so many open questions that are basic, which makes me very, very mad, but, but makes me also excited because there's so much discovery to be had that can be had relatively rapidly because we just haven't asked the question or no one's put money into it. So, you know, we're excited to drive that forward. Did you see the study that came out this past week about creating mice eggs from scratch? I came across it as I was preparing for this podcast. It's the, so the title of the headline, I'll, I'll link this, it's on Stat News and it says, by creating mice eggs entirely from scratch, researchers raise the prospect of a futuristic fertility treatment. The experiment published Thursday in Science marks the first time that researchers have overcome a key hurdle in the hunt for achieving one of reproductive medicine's wilder ideas in vitro gametogenesis sperm and eggs or gametes until recently the only way to make them was inside testes or ovaries ivg promises a new possibility producing them in test tubes from cells which scientists can create from skin and stem cells so that's uh that's a crazy connection right there it, it looks like they created mouse eggs uh from using a cell that is not an ovary, and I'm sure you understand what they're talking about in vitro gametogenesis much better um, than I do, but I, yeah, I thought gametes, that was a fascinating study. Yeah, gametes are, are basically referring to the the, um, the, sec the um, eggs and sperm, and then in vitro mm -hmm. I mean, actually means in glass, but when you do something in vitro, it's like outside of the body. And mm -hmm. um, I think this is really interesting. I do think there's a lot of innovative ideas happening around fertility in particular. And, um, you know, I, I have lots of thoughts about that study. I mean, on one hand, I think expanding options for creating life is helpful, especially for people who struggle with fertility. Um, mm -hmm. I, think, I think that, you know, that will be something that's helpful to someone who is undergoing IVF. It's not clear whether that would be helpful in a broader capacity. And, and one thing that I, that I definitely want to draw a distinction around is, is, is sort of unlinking fertility from women's health because they're intimately related. And, and when we lose our fertility, that's also when we lose a lot of other health parameters because mm -hmm. of the nature of our ovaries. Our ovaries are essentially, you know, they're, they're largely there to allow procreation. And as soon as fertility declines, so do the ovary. And what my vision and goal is with Oviva is really to extend the function of the ovary. Now, is there a future in which we can do in vitro gametogenesis and basically like infuse the ovaries with more eggs mm -hmm. so that we trick them into living longer and functioning for longer? Maybe. I think that's an interesting idea. That's certainly worth testing. Um, eggs tend to be very fragile cells and it's, it's a 
it's no small thing to create them, which I think is a remarkable result. It's going to be really interesting to see. And I, I don't, I feel like I read that study, but I don't know if that just came out this last week because I feel like I read something similar to that. A yeah, the the, this, um, the study may have come out a while back. The article may have just been published this week. It says July 15th, 2021, but it links a study published in Science. Maybe it's so it the actual Steam study science. may have come out a yeah. while ago. Yeah, well, look, stats usually right on top of, of, of real-time science, so it's probably um, quite soon, or it was published last week. But what I'm curious mm -hmm. to know, and I haven't read that study in particular, is whether they then created creatures from those eggs and sperm and then the, the sort of you know health of the progeny the health of the, the animals that resulted from those eggs and sperm that were made from the skin stem cells and then gametes um, I think that's fascinating and very cool and certainly in advance and allows us to better understand eggs um, and fertility and you know there's always these crazy ideas of when are we going to like take life outside the body? Like we're, we're already doing in vitro fertilization. How, like, can we actually incubate a human <laughs> outside yeah. of the human body and, and have that be a thing, <laughs> which feels a bit sci-fi, but I'm sure at some point in the future we'll be doing it. Um, you know, but again, like just coming back to earth a little bit, I think that it's, I'm, I'm always pleased to see advances in this field and for me and for the goal that I have, it's it's not to address fertility so much as it is to address female well-being, and and, and mm -hmm. I'm seeing the link between ovarian function itself and that well-being, and so being able to support the function of the ovary, support the longevity of the ovary as a means to improve the health span in women, which again ties to fertility, but isn't mm -hmm. driven by that necessarily. So there there are ways to. Uh, improve the the quality of life and improve the health span of women by studying the ovary and improving function of the ovary and those functions have little to nothing to do with fertility over ovarian function and fertility no no no, no, no. i definitely wouldn't things? want to say that <laughs> okay no they are yeah, intimately yeah. related to fertility but the, okay. the goal is different so okay, if we okay. presumably if we ex if we expand the function of the in the lifespan of the ovary as long as there's eggs there, then presumably you'd also expand your fertility potential. But what I'm saying mm -hmm. is like women are more than baby making machines. So my goal isn't to allow women to have babies forever. My goal mm -hmm. is to allow women to feel good in their bodies and to be able to relate to the world in a positive way and to not have, you know, the huge disruption that occurs for the vast majority of women when they enter menopause, which is deeply connected to fertility. But my goal is okay. not to allow a 70 year old woman to have a baby if she wants to do yeah. that cool i mean i think there's a lot of yeah. other questions around that that are worth discussing that you know i don't know that this is the venue for that and it's not my point at all my point is is separating the fact that women's fertility is tied to the ovarian function but we don't live to give birth anymore you know that was kind of how we evolved as a species for for women to be mm -hmm. the creators of life and to be pregnant and to give birth and there's plenty mm -hmm. of women who don't want children and there's plenty of women who want to have children but then also want to continue to feel vibrant and normal beyond the age of 52 which is the average onset of menopause and you know what's interesting about menopause is women who tend to enter it later tend to live longer as do their male siblings mm -hmm. so there's this interesting sort of longevity play and and, you know, I think fertility is very, very important and we need to support it, but it's not my goal to extend to extend that. My goal is to extend health span. And I, I see that as being intimately related to the function of the ovary. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to make sure I had that distinction right. So your, your goal is to, like you said, improve the health span, improve the function of the ovary. And as a byproduct, you imagine that fertility would also follow along those lines along with the ovarian function, but it's not, the, the fertility is not the main goal, it's improving the ovarian function. Um, yes, there, you, it's, yes is the short answer. I, I, I think both are important. Mm -hmm. My eye is on a different prize than expanding fertility, but I do think that what in, in our field is called reproductive longevity. I do think that's mm -hmm. incredibly important. 
um, and worthwhile. And certainly a lot of what we're focused on is directly advancing that. Mm -hmm. And I see that as a stepping stone to a broader goal, which is for any woman, regardless of how she relates to her fertility or desire to have children, to be empowered to live with resilience and with vibrancy because her ovaries can function for longer. And so you don't have the huge hormonal disruption that occurs as a result of menopause. So it's really about forestalling menopause, which, you know, again, relates to fertility, but the work I'm Mm -hmm. doing is more to forestall menopause and less to expand the fertility window. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a, a better, a question, a better question on my part would be, what are some of the most exciting things you're working on right now with Oviva Therapeutics that in- incorporate ovarian function as the main goal? What are, what are some of the most interesting things uh, that you've discovered or, or you're working on right now with Oviva? Well, I hate to say I actually can't speak to that because we're still in stealth mode. So most of what we're doing okay. is confidential um, until later this year, most likely. So. Definitely stay tuned because we have some really incredible researchers from MGH and Harvard whose whose science we're translating. And, um, you know, what little I can say is basically that we were developing around a naturally occurring hormone that occurs in our body and and using that in in therapeutic ways to, we hope, improve the longevity of the the ovaries. So, Mm -hmm. you know, there will be more on that coming soon. Stay tuned for Oviva. Follow us on Twitter and you know, social and yeah. online and, and we'll be announcing more soon. Yeah. And all the, all the links for Daisy and Oviva and Cambrian will be in the podcast description. So you can check it out in there as well. Something you mentioned after a fertility was the, the study of mostly male animals because of uh, mm-hmm. what scientists perceive as, as males being less complicated to study when did and i I hope i'm phrasing that right um when did scientists and researchers start incorporating more female animals into their studies to the point where there was there was better data and it was a regular thing Mm -hmm. yeah so it wasn't actually until 2016 that the NIH, um, the National Institutes of Health, which is the largest public funding body of science in, in the United States, it wasn't until the 2016 that the NIH mandated that all studies that they fund include both sexes, unless you're specifically studying something that's, you know, like the testes or the ovaries, obviously, you don't include both mm-hmm. sexes for that. Um, but they only began mandating that in 2016. So it's only been, what, five years uh, that that's been required. Um, it wasn't until actually 1991 that in clinical trials in the United States, it was required to include both sexes. So, you know, when you think of the timelines of drug development, it often takes between like eight and 20 years to develop a drug. So we still haven't really reached that other side of the drugs that are being developed, incorporating both Mm -hmm. sexes fully in their preclinical work. Um, certainly in clinical trials now it's better, but, um, you know, there's this great, historic misrepresent or underrepresentation that is still pervasive even in some drug development now. I'm I'm sure things that are entering the clinic now have have better and more robust data in both sexes, but this is kind of brand new unfortunately. So it's really um Yeah, that's really that year is way later than that's like yeah, that year's way crazy. later than what I was expecting. I was expecting it to be 1960s or, or something. But um, that, that's crazy mm-hmm. that there's that much data without the requirement to study female animals or put as much of a focus on processes in the female body or uh, mm-hmm. the way that drugs impact women in general. I can imagine that having that lack of data leads to a lot of uncertainty and also uh, some harmful effects for women who are taking drugs or getting advice that has only been tested thoroughly on men. Yeah, yeah, definitely the case. Um, We're still seeing the effects of that. And, uh, you know, it's it's partly a policy issue. 
Um, it's partly a funding issue. I mean, in 2018, the NIH budget um, in the U.S. for health was, I think, $36 billion. And, on, and of that, only 15%, roughly $5.5 billion, was dedicated to all of women's health, which includes in utero, through puberty, through fertility, through postmenopause, you know, all kinds of like women's related issues was just 15% of the budget. And only 43 million of that was dedicated to reproductive aging, which is, you know, this decline in fertility and ovarian mm-hmm. decline. And, you know, as I mentioned, I think what's been underappreciated is that when the ovaries lose their function, which happens asynchronously, it happens before any other tissue in the body really, um, which I think we fail to realize. It's another sort of like fun fact from from my learning that we could share from that earlier question you asked me is that the ovaries are really one of the first tissues to decline in function when it comes to aging. Um, and wow. once that occurs, uh, there's this great study out of UCLA from Steve Horvath Labs. He did he does this thing called the epigenetic clock, and mm-hmm. essentially he uses this to measure or approximate the age of different tissues in the body based on the epigenetics of that tissue. And what he found was that when you look at women who've gone through menopause, they have an accelerated aging of 6% in the rest of their body due to the shifts that happen because of menopause. So, you know, there's really tangible, there's really tan, yeah, it's it's really remarkable. And, and, you know, there's a huge increase in the incidence of cardiovascular disease and immune dysfunction and a whole host of other things that are very well documented now. But, you know, it's, it's, it requires attention and there's just not anything out there. You know, there's, so that's, there's just that's no one options. of the, one of the reasons why it would be good to delay the onset of menopause is so that you're not revert, you're not aging, aging the rest of your body. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I, that's a pretty good reason. <laughs> I, I would imagine that, uh, I think that so. comes with, <laughs> yeah. Um, I going off of the differences between how men and women are studied in medicine and women having not received as much uh, attention. It's funny because uh, my partner who is, she's finishing up her PhD in neuroscience right now and she just informed me that uh, men and women experience heart attacks differently, which I mm-hmm. did not know that they they have different symptoms. Like they may experience the typical chest pain, but a lot of women don't get the left arm thing or they, right. they're more likely to have shortness of breath and back pain and thing that things that you wouldn't normally associate with a heart attack. And that mm-hmm. seems like it would cause uh, many problems too specifically, which are if, if you are dating someone that's a, a woman or you, you're living with someone who's a woman and they say that they uh, have shortness of breath or, or back pain, something that would present as a, a more typically as a heart attack in women as opposed to men, you, you might not recognize that if you didn't know. And also as a woman yourself, I imagine there are a lot of women that don't know that men and women experience heart attacks differently. I certainly didn't know. I'm used to the kind of like grab your chest collapse in movies, uh, mm-hmm. pass out from a heart attack. So I thought that was, that was super interesting. Yeah, and that's a classic example. I mean, there's there's a there's a handful of them. The heart attacks are, are, are a big one, and like you said, this basically means that a woman not only just you know in her home, around her family, in random situations, but going to a hospital will often be misdiagnosed because she's not demonstrating what we consider to be classic symptoms because those classic symptoms were understood in a male context. And so when you when you have a different biology fundamentally in some ways that that leads to a different set of classic symptoms but those haven't been defined it means that you're not getting the the right care obviously um you know and there's also a lot of data unfortunately that i think partly owing to this like we we experience we understand disease we understand male disease um and male symptoms and often when women go into a healthcare setting their symptoms are discounted or overlooked or oftentimes sort of attributed to some sort of psychosomatic thing. So there's this like very remarkable, by remarkable, I really mean just terrible history of women who are miscategorized as having like psychiatric illness rather than something very acute that's happening that actually is not related to, you know, your neurological health or or mental health. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it's pretty wild when you really start, when you start like scratching and digging, you realize there's a whole series of mountains, not even one mountain of complexity around this issue. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even just the, the heart attack thing was mind blowing when I learned about it. Cause it's such a common thing that I just assumed would present a certain way across the board. And it definitely, uh, it, it definitely seems like there's a, there's a lot of things out there that would be good to know even for the average person like myself who isn't studying people but just for the good of being with other people I care about and, and you know having them not die <laughs> yeah so I wanted to get into a bit of science communication as we end off in your Twitter bio one of the ways you describe yourself as, as a science storyteller and you certainly mm -hmm. have done that in your TED talks and you do a great job of weaving the science with the story and then incorporating it together to present a, an actionable message. And so I wanted to ask you what makes storytelling such a powerful tool for you and for science in general and how have you leveraged that skill as a science communicator to bring attention to more issues that the general public should be aware of? I think story is one of the most powerful and important tools that any of us have for connection. Um, you know, I think we're moved by story. I think we learn through story. I think we connect via story. Um, and, and I, you know, I grew up in a house of readers. I love reading. Um, I grew up in a house of storytellers. Um, we would stay up late at night, you know, making up stories with each other and uncles and cousins, you know, sitting around a campfire, that kind of thing. And it's just how, it's how I understand the world. And I think it's how a lot of people understand the world. And when it comes to science storytelling, what I think is so important is that so many people find science to be unapproachable or, you know, a lot of people have this, I think it's, it's changed a lot in the last two years with, with COVID, um, but in some ways, COVID has sort of underscored a lot of this, which is there's so much complexity in science. And it can be very difficult to make that approachable for people that aren't trained in science or like think in just a different way. And, you know, mm -hmm. we're all wired a bit differently. Like I, my brain really does not connect well with like chemistry or physics. It's a very specific type of science that I mm -hmm. relate to and feels tangible to me. And I think that what's powerful about story is it makes things tangible that, our minds might not otherwise connect to or relate to or understand if we're just learning it in an academic setting or even in the mm -hmm. news, you know, and, and I'm sure all of us have read those articles or books or whatever that are super dry and you're just like kind of falling asleep, but you really want to know the thing, but it's just like very jargony yeah. and technical and boring and horrible and dry. Um, you know, we've definitely all been there and I hate that just as much as the next person. And I've been lucky in my time to have a number of teachers and mentors who could bring things to life in a way that was more mm -hmm. compelling. And that's what I see in the power of story is it, it, it creates an emotional anchor in some ways that brings things to life. Um, and also, you know, in some ways, I think, especially in this last year and a half or so, it can engender trust. Like we're, we, we need to be able to trust where we're getting information from. And, and ultimately there's a lot of disagreement and confusion because people aren't sure where to place trust or they're placing it in places that aren't, you know, acting in good faith necessarily. Um, I think, I think about this a lot when I think about the anti-vax movement and which mm -hmm. is also using the word natural, um, as a weapon basically to prevent people from getting vaccines. And it's just such a shame because vaccination is one of the greatest technologies that was ever invented and saved so many millions of lives. It's, un it's unbelievable. You know, and um, the sort of agenda against that is killing people. And I think that story is a really powerful way to connect and, and people are using it in, in all kinds of ways to deliver information. And I think that it's a really powerful way to to allow science to be embodied, basically, and to allow people to connect with that science and, and learn something that otherwise can be really complex and, and feel really difficult to understand. And I don't think it's a question of like dumbing things down. I think it's a question of we all can learn. We just need to use a language that's common. And story to me is, is a tool to allow for a common language for learning. 
Yeah, I, a story is such a powerful tool and, and it's something that I try to use as a, as a podcaster, whether it's in the actual podcast or through creating content and clips and, and writing my own thoughts down, even if I'm not sharing them to create a story arch. And the way I've experienced science communication um, from from my point of view is as, as someone who went through most of life not caring about science education, just doing what I had to do to get through it. Like a lot of people in school where, you know, maybe it's not part of your major. I was a business major. I did accounting. And so it's kind of like my pre prerequisite and get it through. Didn't really care. Was going through the dry things. And the last two years, I would say, my science content consumption has spiked and it's not because I've I, I don't think it's because I just have an internal drive that was uh, that's being elevated to explore science I, I don't think I think there's some things that are happening internally but I also think it's uh, people like yourself and I brought up Andrew Huberman before who recognize that there's science and then there's also making people give a shit about the science and those are two entirely mm -hmm. different things and the way you present totally. that information with storytelling makes me care. It makes me want to listen to mm -hmm. a podcast for two hours about hearing or sleep. It makes me want to listen to two TED Talks. It makes me want to be curious about science and, and develop that curiosity. And I really do appreciate uh, people like yourself who are scientists and also uh, I don't want to speak for your process, but as someone who's observing your content, it seems like you definitely put in the effort to make people care. It's not just like, this is science, so you should care. It's like, how am I going to translate this into an exciting mm -hmm. and uh, fascinating manner? Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate that. It's It does take a lot of effort and thought, and I think that's why so often people have um, you know negative experiences with their science learning is because... It's not a common skill among scientists, I don't think. Um, and, I, and I've definitely advocated in my own community and like the science community for greater public engagement and, and greater effort to learn how to do that. And, you know, I was really lucky. I, I got a lot of training in that at UCLA with my mentor there, um, teaching with him for years. And then at Harvard, I actually took some workshops with a, with one of the, with a theater director of the American Repertory Theater who did workshops on, on story and movement and how to connect with an audience. And, you know, it's, I put in a lot of time into that because I really deeply care about it. And I think it's really fun and I think it makes a difference. And I think ultimately, you know, there's a lot of ways to make an impact and there's a lot of people who just, they're so good in the lab. They're so good at the bench. Mm -hmm. They're so good at their focus. And for me, I see a lot of my gift and a lot of what I want to do in the world and for the world is being able to translate and being able to storytell and being able to create impact that way through education and awareness and advocacy. Um, and it's, and it's a different skill set. and, and, you know, we, not everyone needs to have it, but I think we need to recognize how important that is and, and elevate that as something that is important training for scientists and, and for anyone who cares to make an impact in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, it, we're coming up on time right now. I, I wanted to just pick your brain for one thing. If you if you had a, a few more minutes, is, is that uh, okay for one more question? I actually have a doctor appointment to go to, but I have like okay. two minutes. <laughs> okay, uh, two two minutes in in your best uh, two minute summary. Uh, how has modeling informed your science career, and how has science informed your modeling career, and vice versa? Just like if if you could give a general just overview of that because I'm selfishly interested in living these sort of two different lives that seem compartmentalized but may not be. So w what is your brief overview version of those two careers? Yeah, it's it's so fun. I wish we had more time to talk about this because mm -hmm. it's um, they're seemingly completely disparate, as you said. And, and funnily enough, in my PhD, I, I took this like New York Times quiz of what is your opposite profession. And I put mm -hmm. in 
I'm a biological scientist and the opposite profession was a model. And I bring up that anecdote because after the results came up, they have these like graphs of what are the skills that a scientist uses the most and the least and a model uses the most and the least. And, and they sort of like highlight how different the two things are. And so for me, as both a model and a scientist, what I feel really grateful for is that you are developing really a really diverse skill set. Um, you know, science can actually be very physical. Modeling is a very physical job. Obviously, you have to like, look a certain way or keep a certain physique, generally speaking. But you're also, I've done a lot of fitness modeling and, and I've done a lot of lifestyle modeling. And so, you know, you, you need to understand how your body moves and you need to create certain positions and you need to know what that looks like and, you know, clothes make different shapes and you have to have this awareness of how clothes hang in certain ways and what looks good and what doesn't look good. And hilariously, when you're in the lab and you're conducting experiments, it's also very physical. You're on your feet, you're moving these tiny little things from here to there. I did a lot of micro dissection of teeny little, um, you know, structure, tissue structures. Um, and you also have to have super high physical awareness and dexterity and, physicality. And, um, so that's one thing, but then I think one thing that I really took from modeling was that, you know, I was lucky to be able to travel all over the world doing that and work with a lot of really wonderful people, obviously photographers, hairstylists, makeup folks, um, wardrobe stylists, obviously all the clients who are producing the shoots for whatever reason. And, you know, very few of those people were scientists, but, almost all those people had an interest in the kinds of work that the kinds of work that I was involved in in the lab. And so being able to have those conversations with people from all walks of life and, you know, as part of the storytelling piece, it, it allowed me to learn what was interesting to people, what people were curious about, um, where there were gaps in knowledge, what seemed more confusing than maybe I, I realized. Cause most of the times we don't, as, as we get further into our careers, we don't understand how, you know, what's the word? You just get really specialized and you forget what other people know or don't know. Yeah. And so I think it's really helpful and healthy to understand like I'm in a little bubble and there's this whole other world that doesn't relate to that bubble. And that kept me alive in my work and, and it, mm. it allowed me to bring energy in both ways. And, and, you know, modeling also is just really enjoyable for me. So being able to take time to do that and, and have a little bit more creative time away from the lab was really helpful for me. Well, that was a, a great wrap up. Thank you so much, Daisy, for your extra sure. few minutes of valuable time and the, the conversation as a whole. I, I really do appreciate it. I learned a lot and, and I'm sure listeners will learn a lot as well. And I, I'm going to link everywhere that people can follow you and follow your work. And perhaps we can do a, a round two on Oviva Therapeutics and a deep dive into modeling versus science career uh, next time. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on. 